But thank you for being here. We're gonna take our Bible. If you're able, let's stand together to Colossians chapter three. Colossians chapter three, uh, Paul is writing to the Colossae people and uh, a group of people that he has never met before. And he is talking to them about their new life in Christ, that uh, there was the old way and their old nature, and he's now talking to them about their new nature and their new, the new way of living. And so this is what he says. We'll start kind of in the middle of verse nine. Uh, and this is the New Living Translation. It says, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. That's hard to do. Number 10, or verse 10. So put on your new nature. So strip off your old nature and put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. So let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your word. It is what transforms us. It's your word that we hide in our heart so that we might not sin against you. God, so that we could be like you more and more every day. So God, we love you, we praise you. Be with us as we look further into your word in Jesus' name. And together everyone said, amen. You can be seated. You know, today I wanna talk to you about what not to wear. Now, obviously that kind of makes you think this is a fashion message. And clearly I'm not your guy when it comes to fashion. Like I I struggle truthfully to match my socks. Like just, uh, I I don't understand the whole fashion, what color goes with what. And and I know very general basic rules of thumb, but um, in today's day and age, I feel like I know less and less about what is fashionable. I saw some pictures this week. I was just kind of looking at what are the fashions of today. And, and I saw a couple of pictures and I thought like, wow, I, if that's fashionable, uh, I, I mean, how, I don't even know if she could pick up anything with those gloves and she's got her daddy's coat on. I don't, I don't know what's going on. But this next, this next guy, I mean, I, I'm wondering who spray painted his coat and how hot them Thick leather pants must be. I'd wear those shades and look mad too if I had that outfit on. But, uh, you know, and, and I'm just uh, kind of looking. You can go to the next one, guys. And, and uh, this lady here, I, not a thing on her matches. I, I, like nothing, I, and I would wear the mask if I was dressed like that. I'd be like, you, you don't know who I am. Um, so you look at the next one. I, I, this, this, I, this is the Easter bunny. So this is a new Easter outfit for 2023. So we're gonna be seeing this coming around and uh, excited about those donuts that she's wearing. Um, this guy here, I mean, he's just uh, ready to sleep. And uh, I think this is a bedtime outfit. No matter which direction you turn, you are comfortable. Um, you know, you always have a pillow under your neck. If I had this for school, I would have learned nothing. This girl's got black ba- bananas, for God's sakes. I don't even know, like black is not the color I think of when I think of bananas. Like, I mean, you know, honestly, I don't know if they were just like, you know what this outfit is missing? Fruit. Like, (laughs) and then they were just like, what do you think of when you think of black? Bananas. I think of like rent bananas. Like not, this level right here is not even good for banana pudding. Like you, you're too far. That's a trash can thing. So, so is the outfit. But, uh, and then we got Bieber here, uh, the big fat clods. I think Herman Munster wants his outfit back. Um, but like, I just, I'm obviously not connected with what's fashionable, obviously. Cause if that's fashionable, I am out. Like I am way out. But today is not about fashion. So if, if you're wondering like, do I need to be self-conscious about what I'm wearing today? Like, no, 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 no. That's not what today's about at all, actually. But Paul used the imagery. Paul used the imagery to describe what we should put on, what we should not wear, our sinful nature in Colossians chapter three, he goes into great detail of what we don't need to wear and what we do need to wear. And so we're gonna spend some time focusing in on that because uh, the, the message itself is about how God has called us not simply just to be his people, but also to live a certain kind of life. 
See, we're not just called to just be his people, that we are saved and we are going to heaven, but we're supposed to live a certain kind of life here and now. Like right now, we are supposed to be a peculiar people. And if we're going to be peculiar, that means we're not going to be like everybody else. That we're called to live a different kind of lifestyle because we are, whether you know it or not, we are God's representatives to the world. We represent Jesus. So for many, 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 many people, and one major reason that a lot of people are not Christians is because they know a Christian. The reason they're not a Christian is they've met Christians. They've seen them on Facebook. They've seen how they react to everything else and they're just like everyone else in their eyes. But see, God's called us to something different. You see, our identity is in Christ, but it also carries with it the responsibility that we've got to decide what we're gonna not wear and what we're gonna put on. And so Paul begins to talk about that in Colossians chapter three. And so I wanna give you some things today. And the very first thing I wanna give you is that we're to take off judgment and put on mercy. We're to take off judgment and put on mercy. And everybody in the room said, don't believe I would've said that one. I mean, if I was him, I just don't think that's the right thing to do. You're already judging me. See, we're to take off judgment as God's people. Paul said this in Colossians chapter three. He said, since God chose you to be the holy people that he loves, he said, you've got to clothe yourself every day intentionally, just like you did this morning when you got up, you went in your closet and you decided what you were going to wear today or whether you did it last night and this is the only thing you had that was clean or whatever the reasons were, you chose to put on what you've got on. He says, you've got to clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy. That we're to be merciful. We're to extend mercy. But see, that's not in our nature. In mine and your nature, what is natural for us is, the, is what has been passed down from Adam all the way down. From, from when Adam sinned, there was a, what, the, what they call the Adamic nature, the Adam nature that was filtered down through generations for thousands of years. And when you were born, you inherited it And you've got a nature that pulls against mercy. It cries for justice. I want judgment. I want somebody to pay for what they've done. And God said, no, not my people. My people must, they must exercise mercy. Paul said it like this in Romans 14, 13. He said, therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. I hate to tell you this. I really do. I hate to tell you this because some of y'all are banking on this. But God's not going to call on you when you get to heaven and say, listen, I've gotten to one I just don't think I can handle. And I need you to help me judge this guy. You were his neighbor for 35 years and you know all the stuff he did. And I need you to come up and you're not going to go, thank you, God. I got this one. <laughs> like He's not going to happen. Like You're going to be over in the corner with me like this, like, Like, if, if Jesus don't step up and go, hey, he's with me, he's good, he's with me. If Jesus don't do that for all of us, guess what? We're in trouble. Because you're not gonna make it on your own accord. But see, it's not our job to judge. Jesus was telling the story to the, to the disciples and to those that were sitting around one day. He was telling the parable of the, the, the Pharisee and, and the tax collector. And we remember the story. It's in Luke chapter 18. And he begins to tell the story about how the tax collector's praying really loud. You know, they like to be seen. They like to cast judgment on other people for all that they're not doing. But they weren't looking at what they were doing. And so he was praying. He was saying, God, thank you that I am not like this tax collector. I'm not a cheater. I'm not a sinner. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not like this tax collector. And he kept saying it loud enough for the guy to hear. And it's like, okay, I'm getting the point. Like the tax collector is sinking lower and lower. And Jesus tells the story about the tax collector's prayer as he bowed his head and softly prayed before God. And his words in Luke chapter 18, verse 13 is, oh God, be merciful to me for I am a sinner. And Jesus told his disciples in verse 14, he said, I tell you this, that this sinner, not the Pharisee, return home justified before God. See, we don't know the prayers in the hearts of people. We think we do. 
We think we can judge it, but God's not calling you to judge. God's not calling. He's not asking you what you think. God is God in him alone. And he doesn't need our help. He can be God. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 7, 1. He said, do not judge or you too will be judged. Man, by the same measure, I don't want to judge because I, I, I need mercy. I'm going to extend mercy. Jesus said it in the greatest sermon that he ever gave in Matthew chapter 5. He said, blessed are the merciful because they will receive mercy. Every one of us need to realize that, that, that judgment is a boomerang and it comes back to us and so is mercy. And so for every one of you, I'm gonna extend mercy because I need mercy. I need a whole lot of it. As a matter of fact, the more you know me and everybody said, amen. <laughs> I need mercy. James said it like this in James 2.13. He said, there will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. Ouch. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Don't you want to be on that side of, the, of the, uh, uh, the verse here? Like, I want to be merciful so that God will be merciful when he judges me. It's attached to my mercy, and i got to give it away to get it. And so we're going to give it away. We're going to strip off, take off that judgment, put on mercy. But not only that, we're going to take off rudeness and put on kindness. Take off the rudeness. Put on kindness. Hey, listen, in the day and age of customer, no service. Like, aren't you dying for a little kindness? Somebody to just act like they're, they're glad that you decided to give your business to them. Not like you're privileged to get to spend your money with me. Like, are you kidding me? What happened? Like, if you have a business, you may tell you how to just set yourself apart. Love on people. Give them customer service. Give them like... Be nice to them. Be kind. Don't like be rude all the time. Like rudeness is like the currency of today. It's what goes the farthest. Like if I can be rude to you, then you're going to respond. Like what? When did that become the right way to handle things? And it's definitely not the way that God's calling us as believers, as representatives of who he is. People are watching you to see who Jesus is. He's saying, take off rudeness. Put on kindness. Paul said in Colossians 3.12, he goes on to say, clothe yourself not only with mercy, but with kindness. We don't get the option. He said, you must do this. If you're going to be a representative, if you're going to claim Christ, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, you don't have the option. You've got to put on kindness Ronald Reagan said it like this. He said, we can't help everyone, but everyone can help someone. Andy Stanley, Andy Stanley said it like this. He said, do for one what you wish you could do for all. What if every one of us did for at least one what we wished we could do for all? Everywhere we go, we look to extend kindness instead of rudeness. You'd say, yeah, well, I'll give kindness if they were nice to me. Why? Well, it didn't say that. It didn't say, well, hey, listen, if, if they treat you good, then you can be kind to them. If they don't, you just bite their head off. Like that, it didn't say that. It said that we have to be kind regardless. No matter what treatment we receive, we have to take off rudeness and put on kindness. Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 6, verse 31. He said, treat people the same way that you want them to treat you. What if we all treated people in the same way that we wanted to be treated ourselves? Because see, we all want customer service. We're just not really interested in giving it. We all want to be treated with kindness. Just sometimes I'm not in the mood. But what if we treated them like we wanted to be treated? That intentionally every day when we went into the virtue closet, into the closet of all of our virtues, and we decided I'm not going to take on rudeness. I'm going to put on kindness. And I'm going to be kind today. Some of you need to change clothes right in the middle of the day. Like somebody cuts you off in traffic. It's like, oh, where's my coat? I got to put on kindness. <laughs> See, not only that, but we've got a number three, take off arrogance and put on humility. 
take off arrogance. There is no place for arrogance among the people of God because what have you done exactly? Who are you exactly? What have you done in your life making you so successful that God has not equipped you to do? What have you accomplished that God has not took you and placed you in that seat? Whether you were born in the right house, you were born with the right faculties, you were born with the right accomplishments and the abilities to achieve what you've achieved. I know you've worked hard to get to where you are. Yes. Who gave you the ability to work hard? Who gave you the breath in your body to be who you are? Who set you in the right seat so that you could go to the right places and be in the right environment so that you could be who you are? It is all God. We have no place for arrogance because God tells us if we read our word, we know that apart from me, he's saying apart from Jesus, he said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Like that's pretty clear. Like all your goodness, all your accomplishment, all your education, all your successes, all the good things you've done amount to nothing. Nothing. Put that on your resume. (laughs) Apart from God, I've accomplished nothing. Hire me. See, we got to take off arrogance. St. Augustine, who I thought was grass for a long time, actually is a real person. Theologian, I should have known that. He lived in 400 AD. I don't know a lot of people from back then. 400 AD, he said this. He said, it was pride that changed angels into devils. And it's humility that makes men as angels. See, God's attracted to humility. God's attracted to when we humble ourselves and we say, I gotta decrease, he must increase. Less of me and more of you. Like, truthfully, guys, the more you get to know me, the less impressed you're gonna be. I fail every single day. I make mistakes. Like, don't look to me. Look to Jesus. Like, don't look to me. I'm trying. I'm trying to do good, but I don't, I don't get it right all the time. Matter of fact, I get it wrong a lot of times. And what if God's people decide, you know what? I'm gonna be transparent. I'm gonna be honest about my failures. What happens if God's people would really understand that that as we confess our faults one to another, we're going to experience healing? What if we really believe that God said, hey, confess your faults one to another so that you might be healed? What if we really were able to break the walls down and really to be able to say, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes because nobody thinks you're perfect anyway. Like your laundry stinks like mine. You got ring around the collar too. Paul said this in Philippians chapter two, verse three. He said, don't be selfish and don't try to impress others. He said, be humble. Thinking of others as what? Better than yourselves. Better than yourselves. Rick Warren said it this way, the pastor of Saddleback Church. He said, humility isn't denying your strengths. It's being honest about your weaknesses. It's being transparent. And I believe God's calling us as believers, as Christians, to to take off the arrogance, take off the swagger, you know? I mean, I think the world calls it swagger. You know, some people can strut sitting down like they just got it. Like they just, they think they are something. But God said, man, if you're, if you're gonna represent me, if you're gonna walk around every day with a shirt that says, I'm a Christ follower, take off the arrogance. And you need to put on humility. You need to tell them where your source of strength is and not just tell them as lip service, but you better know it in your heart because who are you fooling anyway? God knows my heart. See, we've not only got to take off arrogance and put on humility, but number four, we've got to take off aggressiveness and put on gentleness. Man, gentleness, are you kidding me? How can we get anywhere if we're not aggressive? If we're not going after it? It's the early bird that gets the worm. Like, 
What if we don't run as hard as we can? What if we don't charge after the hill? What if we don't do all these things and go as hard as we can go? And God says, listen, that's not what I'm wanting out of you anyway. I want you to be still and know that I'm God. I want you just to calm down a little bit, be quiet, sit before me and allow me to speak. Before you jump out in front and say what you've got to say, allow me to speak. That we would be gentle. Over the last three years, the article read that Americans are seemingly more angry and more aggressive than ever before. We have seen deep anger and aggression toward elected officials leading to violence and rioting throughout our country and even inside the hallways of Congress. There is anger and aggression toward politicians on both sides of the aisle, both for what they have done and for what they haven't done. Anger rages every time we pay record prices for all our goods and services because of severe inflation. We have seen our country erupt into the worst civil unrest in decades after the death of George Floyd and anger concerning police brutality. At the same time, we are dealing with anger and aggression provoked by a never-ending coronavirus pandemic and its negative effects on our world. Anger and aggression seem to be all of our response toward anyone and anything that doesn't line up right where we want it to. It's our response, but it can't be the response of the Christian's Because we've got to believe and know that God is in control, that God is actually sovereign, that he hasn't lost control. Do we believe it or do we not? Do we think that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by God, that I pick my foot up and he puts it down where it needs to be? That God is working in and through each and every one of us and that we must be, we must be gentle. What would the world look like if Christians were like Jesus and we were gentle and lowly? Solomon said it like this. He said, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Paul said in Philippians chapter four, verse five, he said, let your gentleness be evident to all. Like you, you can't even claim that you are gentle. It's just hiding behind some frustration that you got over something. Like a little pent up, you know, uh, 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 aggressiveness. He said it's got to be evident to all. Seeing as Christians, we've got to take off the aggressiveness. Take off because it's popular to be aggressive. But we've got to take it off when it comes to interacting with other people and put on gentleness. Number five, we've got to take off frustration and put on patience. Take off frustration. And put on patience. Colossians chapter 3 verse 12. He goes on in the list of murder's row here. Of different things we've got to do. He said clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy. That's hard. Kindness. Struggle. Humility. I'm good there. (laughs) Not really. Obviously not. Gentleness. And patience. That I've got to take off frustration with people. Take off the frustration that comes when I interact with my brothers and sisters and when I interact with the world. I've got to take off the frustration and I've got to interject it with patience. That's a struggle. If any of one of you have mastered these things, let me know and write a book. It's a struggle because it's not natural for us. We must be empowered by the Holy Spirit in order to do any of these things because it's not natural. What's natural is for you to be frustrated when somebody cuts you off in traffic, for you to be frustrated when things don't go the way you thought they ought to go. That's what's natural, for you to be angry, for you to get frustrated and mad over things that people do to you or say to you, that you're you're, you're not supposed to have patience with them. Are you kidding me? My patience is wearing thin. (laughs) Like it's a compliment. What I'm telling you, my relationship with God is getting real thin with you right now. My trust that God's going to take care of us is getting real thin. I'm about to take it into my own hands. See, that's not what God wants us. 
What if God's people actually had these virtues in our life? And then he gets into where he's talking about how to how it looks like in practice. What does patience look like in practice? Look at verse 13. This is what he said. He starts out and he says, make an allowance for each other's faults. You know what that tells me? People are gonna have faults. Let's just start there. If you think you're perfect, you're not. You're gonna have faults, but you know what I'm supposed to do about it? Make room for it. I'm supposed to make room for your faults. So that, The second part of this verse actually works. Then I can forgive you when you offend me. Because you know what? You're going to offend somebody. You're going to say something that offends people, especially me. Oh, my goodness. My mouth. I don't even mean to. And I say things, and they're like, and I see I've offended him. (laughs) But I, I, I speak. And I I say things and I wished I hadn't said it. I didn't even think about it and I offend. But you know what I gotta do when people do that to me? I gotta forgive them. I gotta make some space to say, you know what? They're gonna fault me. They're gonna make mistakes. They're gonna do things that I I wish they hadn't have done. They're gonna let me down. And then when they offend you, I'm gonna forgive them. Now, what I'd like for this to say is, when they come back to me and they tell me how sorry they are, and I get a chance to set them straight, (laughs) then it's over. It's over. I promise you it is over then. It's already went too far. He didn't say, I'm going to set them straight. All right, right, make an allowance. But if they do you wrong, set them straight. And then you can forgive them once you set them straight and they ask for your forgiveness. (laughs) Then you can forgive them. Like, I wish we could add addendums to God's word. Like, he forgot some stuff. Like, goodness. Like, I mean, it's been like a thousand years ago. Like, come on. Like, you know, he needs a little help. Like, let me write a few words in. The Cameron translation. And we don't get to do that. See, we just got to forgive one another. Why? And then he says this. <laughs> Here's why. Remember, like he knew we were going to have a problem. And he knew we were going to go, yeah, but. And he says, hey, remember, remember, the Lord forgave you, moron. That's what he says to me. That's how, I don't know if God talks to y'all like that. That's how he talks to me. And he calls me moron a lot. I think that's him. But. He said, remember, the Lord forgave you, so you got to forgive others. See, it's that boomerang. If I don't forgive you, he won't forgive me. And I got to remember that my motive, every time I'm struggling to make room for your faults, every time I'm struggling to forgive you because you hadn't asked me to forgive you, and I'm really not, I'm having a hard time with it because you have offended me, you've hurt me. Every time I'm struggling to forgive, I've got to say, remember... You've offended the Holy Spirit. You've offended God. You've turned your back on him. You've betrayed him over and over again. And he is long suffering for you. He loves you. He's extended mercy and grace to you. And he's forgiven you and you can't forgive somebody else. How have you hurt them worse than we've all hurt God with our sins that sent his only begotten son to a cross? How could you hurt somebody worse than that? You can't. And we must make, we gotta take off the frustration and put on patience. But not only that, we've gotta, number six, take off hate and put on love. In a world filled with hate, we gotta put on love. I'm sorry, I, I, look, I didn't write it. Like it's easier to hate. It's easier just to not like people. I love them, but I don't like them. <laughs> like we, we can tell ourselves anything to make ourselves feel good. But God said we got to love them. And love comes from way down deep. And you know whether you love them or not. Because there's venom in your heart or there's not. You see, God is love. And if we don't have love, it's because we don't have enough God. If you struggle to have love for people, you need more of God in your life. 
You need more of Jesus because the more you get of him, you get into that place where for God so loved the world. God so loved those that are drug addicts, those that are struggling, those that robbed you, those that stolen from you, those that betrayed you, those that's hurt you, for God so loved them too. And he gave his only son. See, it was love that drove God to a place to do unbelievable, irrational act of love. It was love for you and me that drove God to do that. Paul said it this in Colossians 3, 14. We read the last verse that we used. It's above all. If you miss everything else, if, you, if you're missing out on mercy, if you're missing out on the patience, if you're missing out on the humility, hey, above all, hey, at least get this. You gotta choose every morning to put on love. You gotta do it. Because it's what binds it all together. It binds us all together. What's wrong with the church today? We don't love each other. We don't love, we don't think with these virtues, we don't have them. We're worried about just, we're worried about, hey, I don't want to go to hell. That's why I come to church on Sunday, make sure I'm good. But after that, it's my own life. I'm doing my own thing. I got my own ways and I'm working this thing out. Now God needs to back up and don't bother me. I'll see him in heaven. That's how we treat him. Like, I got a life to live, God. Don't mess with me. Now, I mean, if I have trouble, I'll holler at you. I mean, keep your phone on, but I'll call you. See, we got to take off hate and put on love because it's a supreme virtue for us. Peter said it like this in 1 Peter 4, 8. He said, above all, keep loving one another. So Peter apparently he thought it was the most important to love one another earnestly. Listen, it must have been important because Jesus included it too. In Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39, Jesus said this. He said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And I like wish you would have stopped right there. Like, cause that's, that's kind of like, you can't tell if I'm doing that or not. Like, don't judge me. Remember point number one. Like, I love the Lord. Sure do love him. Sure do love him. Love him. Yep. I love him. All my heart and soul. You don't know. But then he went on. He said the second one, like that, that's the first one, but the second one's like it. And this translation said it's equally important is that we're, we gotta love our neighbor as ourselves. What? I love me. I really love me. Like I was pulling a weed eater yesterday. It was flooded. And I'm not mechanically inclined. And I called a guy and he said, look, you gotta do this and you gotta just keep pulling it and it'll come, it'll, it'll crank up. Well, it did. He lied to me, but I forgive him. <laughs> but I was pulling the weed eater, pulling the weed eater. I'm sore today from pulling the weed eater. I'm pulling, 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 pulling. My allowance is running out, running out of room. Pulling, 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 pulling. Tore, tore my, my baby skin. <laughs> I got a Band-Aid. And immediately, I, mm. my whole body was concerned about me. I put the weed eater down. No patience, frustration. I took off my patience. I put on the coat of frustration. It fit nicely. But you know what? It's hard to love other people as much as you love you. That's no excuse. Just because it's hard and difficult, everything that we just talked about is difficult. And if you don't get more of Jesus, you can't do it. So when you see somebody that's not doing it, pray for them. They need more of Jesus. 
See, we can't act like we're super holy if we're not clothed in these virtues. We can't just tear somebody up on Facebook and act like we did it in Jesus' name. Like, yeah, you did it in Jesus' name and you just hurt Jesus' name. Like, love people. Give mercy to people. Give kindness to people. Be humble. Be gentle. Be patient. See, those are the virtues that God's called us to. And if we will do that, you know there wouldn't be a seat in this place. It's so exciting what God's gonna do across the street, but we need a new sanctuary in a hurry because this place would be slammed every single Sunday. We'd have to have 20 services a day. Why? Why can't we do that? Because we've gotta be the church that God's called us to be. We've gotta have something that's desirable. And God's called it to us. He's told us what not to wear. And he's told us what to put on. 